Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. And welcome back. Another episode of Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. And today we're doing just that, talking about books and writing and stuff with the award-winning Anthony Badalka from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. He's a proud prairie lad. Um, I don't know why. It's not my favorite place in the world, but it is his. Anthony Badalka, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thanks, Dennis. I'm glad to be back. It's always good to talk about books and things with you. It is, and the book we're talking about is right in front of me, Going to Beautiful. just came out a few weeks ago. Um, we're not trying to date ourselves here, because this will be up in the universe forever and ever, but Going to Beautiful seems to be a, a smash hit right out of the box. Is that right? Yes, you know, it, I'm really pleased. It's really doing well. Last week we were number seven on the uh, Canadian fiction bestseller list, which is really exciting. And, you know, I've actually been doing some uh, book touring with this book, you know, now that we're slowly trying to make our way out into uh, in-person events. So I've done some uh, events in Alberta and, of course, Saskatchewan. I'm going to be going into BC soon. And it's, uh, you know, the in-person events are really doing well. We're getting good crowds out. And and then, you know, nicely that's turning into some some nice sales and some bestseller lists in, uh, in Calgary and Edmonton as well. And has your uh, wrist got sore from signing all those copies? Well, you know, a lot of people ask me that, and that's got to be one of my favorite things to do is to sign books it's just uh you know it's that one you know period of time where it's just kind of you and that person in front of you and it's that that lovely kind of communion between writer and reader and i always like to to write more than just you know have a good read you know sign it anthony i always like to say something that just comes to my mind and I, you know, I'm sure a lot of people take the book home and go like what the heck is he talking about in, in here because sometimes my, my writing might get a little messy but uh, but no I, I love doing it and uh, we have a number of your books in our home library one of them talks about Diane's wonky sense of humor so <laughs> <laughs> And I believe it still is wonky, isn't it? Everything about her is wonky, but that's another story. Uh, back to going to beautiful. Uh, the first six words, that's what drew me in. Life would go, white, excuse me. <laughs> Life was good until it wasn't. And that sort of sums up our recent incident. Uh, we were going down the highway. Everything was good. And 30 seconds later, it wasn't. So what? Did you come up with that to start the novel, or is that something that you added at later revisions? No, that was really, you know, in a way, Dennis, that was the whole impetus for the book. I really, when I set out to, to write this book, I, you know, it was, a lot of it was written as we were sort of heading into the pandemic and experiencing that, um, you know, and there was, you know, things that, you know, all of our lives get complicated with things and be they, you know, dealing with, with aging parents or health issues or death in the family. And just in, you know, talking to people as, you know, as we all went through this big world event, there was a lot of sense of loss out there. And I, I, I decided very quickly that I didn't want to write about the pandemic and I didn't want to write about anything that was focusing on loss, but I wanted to write the reverse of it. But of course, when you're writing about joy and happiness and recovery, the, the flip side of that is loss and tragedy and just the fact that in the blink of an eye, things can change. And so that, you know, those first words, I think, sum up my whole desire for what this book was meant to be where you just you know the world is wonderful and then boom all of a sudden it isn't and then my hope and my desire is that by time you reach the last page you've completely turned that over once more 
and you know my 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 view of, of people as they reach the last page is I want them to have a, a smile on their face and their heart to be full. And that's a great ambition. And I want to go back to the beginning. What was your what if moment like when you're plotting or thinking about what you're going to write next? Because uh, like Stephen King, for example, what if there was a pet cemetery where pets came back to life? Then he writes the book. So did you have a what if moment for this one? I think the, you know, the general what if moment was, you know, what if you did have this fairy tale life? And we're all sort of familiar with, with fairy tales. And what if suddenly that ends? and everything that you knew to be good and everything that you loved and everything that you valued, be it relationships or career or even down to your pet, if suddenly all of that feels like it's being taken away from you, what then? You know, how do you, how do you recover from it? And, and I think for me, you know, extending beyond that was just the whole idea that sometimes what you need to do is look in places that you wouldn't have thought you would look for either, you know, redemption or recovery or hope or, or joy. I remember Anthony Badalka, the author of Going Too Beautiful and at least a dozen other books. Uh, first time I visited your place um, in Saskatoon, there was a, a number of Lee Child books. Um, was he sort of a inspiration for your early days? Yeah, for a, a little bit. I mean, I was sort of more, um, I started with some James Patterson. I like James Patterson a fair bit. Of course, Gail Bowen has been my mentor for for most of my career. You know, I liked reading uh, David Baldacci uh, was another favorite of mine. Uh, Kathy Reichs was a big one. And then John Sanford. Have you read... Uh, much of his, I think it's called the Prey series. Yes, and in fact, I listen to a lot of the audio versions. That's what. Ah, there you go. Puts me to yeah, sleep. So I, <laughs> yeah, I read a lot of those books too. Yep. And it's not so much that I aspire to write like those people, and and you know, my books are very different than a John Sanford book. But for me, what I get from reading writers like like these is I always kind of want to surround myself with writers who are much better than I am <laughs> and, then, and then they you know they teach me and they and they you know really push me to reach you know new levels in my own writing Lucas Davenport's the main character in all those uh, yeah that's yeah. right that's and right. then his buddy goes off once in a while and does his own thing I'm looking at the back of uh, Going to Beautiful Anthony Badalka's uh, latest uh, but not certainly going to be the last big success and from our good friend Alan Bradley he says you've created a whole new genre of Saskatchewan Gothic what did you think about that? Yes, you know, Alan was so wonderful when I, I reached out to him. And, of course, he's got, you know, strong, strong ties to Saskatchewan. So, you know, he knows Saskatchewan well. And I think when he read this book, it wasn't at all what he expected. So, uh, and fortunately, in a, in a pleasant way. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, when you've got things like that being said by, you know, incredible writers like, like Alan, it, um, you know, for me, it just really inspires me to go out and, and do even better and, and, and surprise him again with something different. And uh, we have sort of a family connection with Alan and Jeff Bradley because Diane's first job out of college was at the University of Saskatchewan working with Alan Bradley at Educational Television. And then uh, Jeff Bradley was at CTV for probably still is for a number of years. So yeah, well, everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody. I didn't know that about uh, Diane's connection. That's, that's interesting. And you've had a busy day today, apparently, what with podcast interviews and stuff. And apparently you've been uh, talking things over with another one of our former guests, Linwood Barkley. Is that true? Yes. Yes, I'm going to be interviewing Linwood on Thursday evening. Ah. And, and I remember listening to your uh, podcast with him. I think that was in 2021, right? Yep. Yeah, he's a great yeah, guy. I think his book, yeah, his book "Find You First, I think, was just out when you talked. About right. Yep. Yeah. And I don't know when he finds time to write because he's always talking about the latest TV series he's binging on. <laughs> 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 so we'll see what happens with that one. So, uh, what forum are your podcasts uh, delivered uh, through? You know, they're all 
very different. And I, you know, I, I take no control over that at all. It's, it's whoever is sponsoring the, um, the podcast. So for Linwood's actually, it's something different that I hadn't heard of before. It is, um, hold on here. I want to find this and see if you've heard they're using, uh, Google Meet, and they use a program called OBS, which I've not used or heard of either of those. Yeah, I've heard of Google Meet, and I've used uh, that once, and I used Zoom once a couple of times. But I don't like those as much as just a telephone call because the picture yeah. gets in the way of the words. So, um, yeah, that's well, great. I was, I've used Zoom quite a lot for podcasts and interviews over the last uh, uh, number of weeks, and it's I I don't mine when there's the picture but i did one the other day where only my picture was visible and the interviewer <laughs> decided not to show his face and i thought that was unfair <laughs> that's true i agree that's unfair so uh, <laughs> other than writing now what is your daily routine i guess it kind of changed over the last few years i mean yes and no i mean when like it with the pandemic, it actually, from a writer's perspective, or at least from my perspective as a writer, it was actually a pretty good thing because I, you know, as you know, I, I'm quite involved in the community as well. And I, you know, would typically sit on a lot of boards or committees, uh, do a lot of social things as well. And, you know, suddenly with the, with the pandemic, many of those things just disappeared or they took much less time because you could do them over zoom and so suddenly you know i had really nice chunks of time that were uninterrupted and i think that's why you know going to beautiful you know really came to me and got created you know much you know much more quickly than than some of my other books have um but you know my my typical routine when I'm actually writing a book is very different than it is today when I'm promoting a book. Um, when I write, I'm pretty um, pretty dedicated to it as almost like a job, and I think that comes from my background as a CPA. So I will, you know, I'll start my writing day, you know, any time between eight or or eight thirty, and you know, I'll usually go straight through. You know, into mid afternoon. Um, of course, when a book comes out, as I you know just now have released, uh, going to beautiful, I almost do no writing. It's all about uh, promotional efforts, um, and it, you know, I always tend to be working on three books. You know, there's the one that you're promoting, the one that's out there. There's the one that's coming up next. You're sort of doing editing on that, which I'm doing on my next book. And then there's the one that's kind of, you know, swirling around in your head going, hmm, I wonder if that's what I'm going to write next. All right. <laughs> so like you say, other than uh, writing, you are involved in a lot of uh, community events in and around Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. One of them that's dear and, and near, dear and near or near and dear to your heart is Camp Firefly. What's that all about? Yes. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Camp Firefly is something that we brought to Saskatchewan, gosh, probably about 15 years ago. And so even though it's called a camp, that's just in name only. This is, it's actually much more of a life skills and leadership retreat for LGBTQ youth. And so in simplistic terms, what we'll do is, you know, youth will apply to come to this four-day camp, and then we bring in professionals from the community to, you know, teach them these life skills or the resiliency skills, and that can be done, you know, through the arts, through uh, talking to business people. And, it, you know, it's so wonderful. Like, everyone volunteers their time. And what is also you know, really satisfying now that this camp has been around for, you know, a decade and a half is that we're now seeing a lot of our early campers come back as leaders and workshop facilitators. And so that's, you know, that's very heartwarming to us that this, this works. And which I, you know, I know, you know, we knew that from the start, this was something that needed to happen in this province. Uh, LGBTQ youth are, um, you know, there's some 
you know, statistics for suicide and uh, drug and alcohol abuse that would, you know, curdle your blood. Um, so it's it's really nice to be able to, I think, address that in uh, in a way that's very positive. And the, you know, I think one of the big strengths of this camp is that for those four days, these youth, many of which come from rural areas, places where they may believe they're the only person like them, uh, for four days suddenly they are in the majority. And to sit with other people like you is a very powerful thing. And I think we can all relate to that. You know, we all are outsiders in one way or another. And if you find someone who who likes what you do, whether it's taste of music or or, or sexual orientation, it feels good and it's a powerful thing. Well, it's like when I meet up with all my cousins, I go, oh my gosh, they look like me or I look like them. I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing when you look at our family, but it's, I know. I think that's a very good thing, Dennis. You're <laughs> it's a, it's, a handsome it's, it's, group of people. <laughs> <laughs> now, I must confess, I'm partway through going to, be, I have like 22, 23, you, with my job, I've got, I've read, I've got 22 or 23 books on the go all at once. So oh I'm going back and forth and talking. But I did pick up one theme I seem to get right at the start. Uh, we won't give away the plot details, but it seems to be there was this celebrity circus following the incident that led off the book that a uh, lack of privacy for celebrities. Now, do we really need to know everything about everybody all of the time? Yes, it can be a very intrusive thing, uh, that's for sure. I think what I tried to do with that little you know, capsule of, of the book is, because it, you know, it is very much part of our culture today, and particularly celebrity culture, and to investigate it from the inside, because both of the, you know, the, the main characters that we meet at the beginning, Jake Hardy and Eddie Kravitz, you know, they are both celebrities in their fields, you know, one being a celebrity chef and the other being a, a fashion designer. And it, I, I really enjoyed writing it from their perspective because they, it, it may seem very intrusive, but they also got things from it. You know, there's parts of it that really fed into their lives in a very strong and what seemed a positive way. It, what was interesting to me was then to write the part of, you know, that's part of what gets ripped away and how that can either buoy you or it can destroy you. Because even though, you know, within the same breath, and again, without giving too much away, within the same, you know, breath, that, you know, that culture was there to turn against Jake, but there was aspects of it that really helped him through a really difficult time. And I think there's a part of the book where he talks about how he he knew that he had to do some grieving in public because that was the life that they courted. And in part, it it gave him some level of comfort. But it's a very, it's a complex issue for sure. Yeah, yeah more than a double-edged sword, it's about five or six different edges to it, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But on a on a lighter note, I think uh, those kids nowadays, like I got up this morning and they tell the whole world that they got up this morning. Then they say, I put on a pair of socks all by myself. Then they have to tell the whole world that they put on a pair of socks. <laughs> yes, but you know, Dennis, what I find interesting about that is if, if no one cared, they would stop doing it, right? Right, so, right. so they all really, care. Really, who's... <laughs> Whose issue is it? Right. You know, because if you know, Dennis, if you started every morning <laughs> going on to, to Twitter or Instagram and just talking about putting on your socks, and suddenly if you got six hundred likes, <laughs> you probably might do it again the next day. That's right. <laughs> but if nobody liked it, you would stop. So, that, well, there's that. I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, it's that endorphin little rush I think you get when you yep. see that everybody liked it. Um, yeah, yeah, and the, and the danger is that you know. Do we start becoming a culture that really needs and craves those little hearts and those little likes to feel worthwhile? Exactly. Um, yeah. Back to the writing business for a moment here. Now, did you do a discussion or 
something recently about how the book or any book goes from like the first time you start typing a draft to final publication. Can you go run through those steps, at least in your case? Yeah, yeah. You know, well, what I did, um, it was a, a couple of things. I did two things uh, for um, the Regina Public Library. I did a talk and it was called, you know, From Seed to Shell. So basically, you know, from the seed of an idea to when a book hits the shelf, like what are, you know, what are the things that you go through? And then the other thing I did is um, very early on when I uh, first was conceptualizing this book, Going to Beautiful, and knew that I was going to publish it, I created what I call the Beautiful Bunch. And I invited, uh, you know, whoever was interested to sign up for this. Basically, it was a newsletter that I put out probably once every month and a half. And just sort of, you know, recounting what were those steps and what were the things that you had to go through. Um, so that was a 45-minute talk that I did, so I won't repeat that here. But, you know, one of the interesting ones was, you know, from the very beginning, and this is something that I tell new writers when they want to talk to me about trying writing or young writers. And I say one of the most important things that you need to ask yourself as a writer is, why do I write? And that's a tough question. It's, it's harder to answer than you might think. And it gets complicated because, you know, that answer can change over time as you grow and develop and mature as a person or as a writer. Um, and it, you know, it took me decades to really start to embrace what my why was. And, you know, I have, you know, finally really settled on an answer, which is that, you know, I write because I want to write stories about underrepresented characters and underrepresented settings in an accept accessible and entertaining way. And I think Going to Beautiful hits on all those cylinders. So when I, you know, first did talk to people about steps, that was my number one step was just why am I writing this book? And and that's, you know, that's a key first step. And then after that, you know, it really comes down to everything from the editing process and having, you know, really sometimes serious and difficult conversations with editors and then, you know, moving ahead to, you know, close to the, the release date where you're really trying to figure out promotion. Like I had a, I have a marketing plan that is, you know, 50 plus pages long. Uh, it's really in depth. And a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, at 12 books, I have a lot of experience and I've tried a lot of different things. And, uh, you know, my perspective is you have to throw as much as you can at, at the promotion of a book because it's, you know, unless you want someone unless you only want your mom to read your book, <laughs> you have to, uh, you know, you have to work at it. And it's, it's the business side of writing that I, you know, I know some writers don't enjoy, but it's, it's important to do. And how does your mom like your writing? <laughs> Actually, she just called me yesterday and just finished the book. <laughs> <laughs> and she, uh, uh, well, her, her main comments were, you know, she really, she really loved the characters and she really liked the fact that there wasn't any sex. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a win, Dennis. That's a win, win all around. <laughs> <laughs> Got the stamp of approval for, from Mother Johanna. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and uh, the book is published by Stonehouse Publishing. How did you um, contact them or did they contact you? Because I haven't heard that name before. Are they new? Uh, yes, they're relatively new. I, uh, they started in, I think it was 2015. Uh, so they're a fairly new publisher in Canada. They're based in Edmonton. And um, so I, I work with an agent. So uh, I, whenever I, I, I write a piece of material and if I don't have uh, a publisher that it's meant for, I will hand it to my agent. So he's, he's the one who identified Stonehouse and like you, I had not heard of them. Um, and he arranged a meeting for, you know, myself, uh, you know, my agent, the lead publisher and the lead editor at Stonehouse. And of course this was by zoom. Oh, of course. And, yep. and you know, the first 
20 minutes of this meeting. So this meeting was supposedly to talk contract details. And that's what I was expecting. But the first 20 minutes were the publisher and the editor talking about how much they loved this book. <laughs> and I just immediately knew this is the home for this book. I really didn't care anymore that I hadn't heard of them. They really got what I was doing with this book. And they really, you know, cared that it, it got out there. And that, you know, particularly at this point in my career, that matters most to me. Because if I am writing a book that is near and dear to my heart and, and you know, hits on all those four cylinders that I talked about, my why, I want, I want that to be out there. And they wanted it as badly as I did. So to me, that was win-win. And, you know, and they have definitely followed through on their promise. They've been incredible supporters uh, of the book and are doing whatever they can possibly think of to, to make it successful. So it's been a, a really happy experience with them. And that's the book is going to beautiful Anthony Badalka from Stonehouse Press. And um, it actually has um, like a, you're not a niche uh, writer or publisher anymore, are you? You've got, like you said, number seven in overall fiction, so it's not just aimed at a certain crowd. You've just broken through to the big time. Well, you know, it's... Uh, I... That, that's that's my, my goal, because when you think about it, you know, Dennis, you know, this book has, um, you know, it's got a cast of a bunch of Ukrainians, a Chinese cafe owner, a transgender best friend, uh, a nun, most of whom live in rural Saskatchewan, most of whom are 55 plus. Uh, it's a mystery, but not really a mystery. I mean, not an easy sell. Right. You know? <laughs> uh, so so it, it really does my heart good to, to see this book do well. And I think people are, you know, they're they, they like something that's different and maybe blurs the line of, of genres and, and you know, introduces them to characters and places that maybe they haven't seen before. That's, and it, that's what I hope to provide to, to people, and so it feels good that, that people are responding. And it doesn't, uh, the book, in my opinion, doesn't put the, like a, a big spotlight on and saying, see, look at me, I'm different, you should pay attention. It's just like two regular guys, and this is what happens to them. Nothing yeah, exactly. big deal about yeah. it, because yeah. everything, tragedies, as we all know, happen to anybody, anytime, and within a blink of an eye, like you said, uh, things can turn around completely. So that, that's... Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, Dennis, and that's the Ouch. accessible part of my why, you know, yeah. To talk about things like that, but not, you know, in a way that, that feels comfortable for people to accept it. Excellent. And actually, like in the words of Rodney King, can't we all just get along? Yeah. <laughs> a couple more things before we wrap it up. Um, Turks and Caicos. Ah, what's special about that? Hmm. Mm. I think I've heard about that place. <laughs> yeah, it's, these guys have <laughs> yeah, a place so as, there. As you know, uh, <laughs> we have a... We have a little condo on the beach there, and it's you know kind of our our happy place. And uh, you know, I'm, uh, this is such a busy time. Like, as you know, book release date, as you know, is that's a busy time, and it's it's a you know a book gets old quickly, so you've got to make hay while the sun shines. So I'm I'm extremely extremely busy. But about mid June, uh, we've uh, kind of squeezed in a little period of about seven days I'm going to zip out there and sit on the beach and maybe have a margarita or two. Or two, yes. Uh, One-way trip to Margaritaville, yes. <laughs> okay. And on a semi-serious but still uh, close to your heart, Ukraine. Obviously you have a Ukrainian background which uh, it resonates throughout uh, all of Saskatchewan, all of Western Canada, I think. Um, well, Diane's name is Anderson, but that's because his grandfather's name, the guy who hired him couldn't pronounce it, so he changed it to Anderson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Ukraine, it's, a, like I said, very important to you, I assume. Yes, it certainly is. And when I had my launch for going to Beautiful in Saskatoon last weekend, I think it was, and we had, and of course, you know, you plan your launches months in advance. And so this was, you know, we were planning as things were just turning sour in Ukraine. And I contacted a 
Ukrainian vocalist and asked if she would perform at the book launch, which also worked because there are so many Ukrainian characters in this book. Yeah. And, you know, originally the intent was that her performance would be a, a celebration of some type of victory. Um, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case. So it ended up being, you know, another kind of small show of support. So I was really glad to be able to do that because I, you know, I know some sometimes people feel that the small little things that people are doing, like putting up the blue and yellow flags on Facebook or what have you, are inconsequential. And I don't, I don't feel like that. I, I think any small thing you can do is worthwhile and it's just it's a sign of support and a sign of positivity so at at the book launch we had um our singer a, a young gal you know age of 13 oh. and she uh you know brought the house down she sang the uh, ukrainian national anthem and then she wrote her own song about what her feelings were about what are what is happening in ukraine and it was you know just a, an incredibly beautiful song um so it's you know it, it is a very difficult uh, subject and i you know the people of the ukraine are our people as you know there's a there's a large ukrainian population in saskatchewan and we you know so many of us have if not direct relatives we have friends who have relatives and so we hear the stories and we know what people are going through and you know there are people living here who you know their whole days are consumed with worrying about their brother or sister or mother or father and they're fighting for their lives and it's just so unbelievable in 2022 that this is possible and we're all a nation of immigrants um mostly it, it like uh, my grandparents came from england or norway so basically i'm third generation at the most probably second same with diane probably just we're just second generations our parents were born here and we were but not necessarily the grandparents so yeah. and that and where it's night what is it 2022 already so well everybody has a direct connection uh i have to wrap it up and i'm sure you have other things to do but i want to say anthony badalka the author of going to beautiful uh please get out and read it and buy it and tell your friends about it and anthony diaka you <laughs> yeah you dennis this was terrific always good to talk to you thank you for visiting with us today this is Talking Books and Stuff with Dennis Rimmer. Contact him at dennis at talkingbooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at amazon.ca. Oh, oh.